Good morning. Man, so excited that you guys are here. Welcome to Upstate Church Anderson. Uh, my notes tell me that I'm supposed to be going short today. I have less notes than normal, and that's the most dangerous kind of sermon, all right? So I'm going to try not to go uh, too long this morning, but because of that, I do want to take maybe just a, a couple of moments for maybe a little bit of a, a family meeting, some family time here for a second, and let you know about two things that are coming up over the next month or so that I really just want to encourage you to be invested in. The first of those things is actually next Sunday. Hopefully by now you know that we're having baptism Sunday. Next Sunday, I just want to celebrate together. There are 10 people who will be baptized here next Sunday. Just an amazing picture of what God is doing here. I think, I hope at this point we're all on the same page about this. But we are about life change at Upstate Church. That's what we're here to see happen. We want to connect people with Jesus because we think that changes everything when people connect with Jesus. And so we have this beautiful picture of that death to life, life change and baptism that we're celebrating next Sunday. But just a, a kind of an additional thing about that that I want to make sure we're all aware of. People will have an opportunity next Sunday to come hear the gospel preached, respond for salvation at that service, and actually be baptized right then. We're, we're removing all the obstacles. We're going to have clothes ready for them. We're going to have towels ready. We're going to have absolutely everything that would remove any obstacles. We have people ready to counsel with those people. So here's my challenge for you. First challenge for this morning. If you live in Anderson, if Anderson is your home, you know people who live here in Anderson who don't have a church home, and who don't have a relationship with Jesus. I really want to challenge you. Invite them to church with you next Sunday. Bring them. You know someone who needs to know Jesus. Bring them with you next Sunday. Say, hey, we're having an amazing day, just an exciting day at our church. I want you to be here. I'm going to be honest with y'all. Get here early. Get a parking spot. It's, it's going to be packed. With that many baptisms, families will be here. It's going to be a full Sunday. I don't want us to miss our opportunity to connect people in Anderson with Jesus. So I really want to challenge you to do that. Maybe you've got family members, coworkers, neighbors. Invite them to come to church with you next Sunday. Uh, the second thing that I want to bring to your attention, really similar, we'll have a Christmas Eve service here in this room on Christmas Eve uh, at 1130. All right, I know it might be a little bit of a weird time with, with Christmas Eve being on Sunday morning. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but that kind of changes everything. So, so again, there are people in your life, people who live in your neighborhood, you go to the grocery store with, you work with, uh, they're in your family who don't have a relationship with Jesus, who don't go to church with anyone. What we've learned is Christmas Eve is the number one day of the year where people who don't know Jesus are willing to try church out, where people who aren't a part of church are willing to be a part of it. Um, they're coming with their families. They're, they feel maybe that they should be in church, and so it's an easy day to invite them. So we'll actually have invite cards that we'll be passing out on the Sundays leading up to Christmas Eve. I just really want to challenge you. Go ahead and start asking people who are in your life, who you know, who don't have a relationship with Jesus so that they'll be here with you on Christmas Eve. I'm so excited about those two things coming up, and I'm thankful that you guys are a part of it. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray for us really quick, uh, and then we're going to dive into God's Word. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for all you're doing in our church. Uh, as we open up your Word, uh, as we worship you through uh, the preaching of your Word, Holy Spirit, we're praying you'd move, you'd speak. We know your Word never returns void, so move now, Lord. We love you. In your name I pray. Amen. I know that we've kind of, we've passed Thanksgiving, so I don't know about you guys, but I know most people, they're kind of moving into Christmas. We can now move on from the debate about whether it's too early for Christmas music. Turn up, Bing Crosby, you're good. Put Michael Buble on, like we're good for Christmas music, no matter who you are now. But before we jump full-fledged into Christmas season, we do want to spend some time this morning in God's Word looking at what the Scriptures tell us about gratitude. As we just celebrated Thanksgiving on Thursday, as a church family, we want to spend this morning looking at what God's Word says about gratitude and how thankfulness, how gratitude should serve as the lens through which we see our lives, the, the lens through which we see the world around us. 
the worldview that we kind of attack our days and our world with. And so that's what we'll see actually from Psalm 138 this morning. If you have your Bible, if you go and turn to Psalm 138, we'll be reading from David's psalm there here in just a minute. The reality is that we are incredibly blessed people. For many different reasons and in many different ways, we are are so blessed. We have a lot to be thankful for. Maybe when you think about thankfulness, you think about your family or your friends. Maybe you think about the good things that God has allowed you to experience, or maybe you really love your job, or there's a hobby that you're really passionate about. And you know, man, you can be thankful for those things. I'm thankful for you guys. I'm thankful for our church and the opportunity that we have to have community together. This morning, we will be focusing on thanksgiving because our gratitude, our worship, our praise, that is what we have to give back to God. This morning, gratitude is important. We think it's important enough to take today to look at God's word and see what it has to say about gratitude because that is what we have to give back to God The apostle James says, every good and perfect gift comes down from the father of heavenly lights. That means two things. Number one, it means if you have good things in your life, God gave them to you. If there are good things in your life, God is the one who gave them to you. That's what it means. Secondly, it means if God has put things in your life, they are good and perfect. So James tells us every good and perfect gift comes from the father of heavenly light. If you have good things in your life, God has put them there. And if God has put something in your life, then you can know that it is good. God has given you, has given me more than I could ever possibly pay back. More than you could ever possibly earn or, or, or be or have somehow lived up to. I could, I could never live up to. I could never earn the things that God has given me. All that we can give back is our gratitude. All that we can give back is our worship. I kind of think about it like God is kind of like your dad at Christmas. I don't know if any of the dads in the room, you're this way, but dads are incredibly difficult to buy Christmas presents for. What does dad say when you're trying to buy him a Christmas present? Well, what do you want? Oh, I don't need anything. I just, yeah, I just want you guys to be here. That's my Christmas present. It's like, no, I'm asking you what I can get you though, right? It's not the same thing. God is like the ultimate dad at Christmas, right? What could I possibly give back to God? What could you possibly get God that he doesn't have? God, the psalmist says that God owns cattle on a thousand hills, which is just my favorite Bible way of saying, God doesn't need anything. God doesn't need anything from us. There's nothing I can add to God that he doesn't already have. So all we can give back to God is our gratitude. All we can give back to God is our worship, is our praise, our thanksgiving. It's what we have to give back to God. I love the way that uh, a song called Gratitude by Brandon Lake says it. Some of you will be familiar. It says, I throw up my hands and praise you again and again because all that I have left is a hallelujah. I know it's not much, but I've nothing else fit for a king. All that we have to give back to God is our praise, our worship, our gratitude. And so as we read from Psalm 138 and starting in verse one this morning, what we will see is that David, the psalmist here, King David, is sharing his sense of gratitude, his lens that he's seeing the world around him, and he's calling us into that same kind of gratitude in our lives. Let's begin reading Psalm 138 verse one. David says, I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down towards your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul, you increased. All the things of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. 
Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. So what does this passage teach us about gratitude? First, it answers the question, how should we thank God? This passage of scripture answers the question, how should we thank God? Let's start back in verse one. David says, I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. How should we thank God? With everything that we have. How should we thank God? With our whole hearts. Here, what the psalmist is telling us is that gratitude to God actually requires everything that we have. Gratitude to God requires our whole hearts. You may say, why is that true? How does that work? Some of you guys are Clemson fans. Some of you guys are South Carolina fans. We might've learned this yesterday, okay? You can't really cheer for South Carolina and for Clemson. There are weird people who try to say they cheer for both, but that's just not, it just doesn't work that way on rivalry weekend, right? You gotta pick one. Jimmy and I were worried last night because our Georgia Bulldogs didn't look too good. You cannot be a fan of Georgia and Georgia Tech. It doesn't, it just doesn't work that way, especially on rivalry weekend, you can't have divided loyalty. Fandom doesn't just really work that way. We can't have divided loyalty. And really our worship to God works the same exact way. God will not accept half-hearted devotion. God does not accept divided loyalty. A relationship with Jesus, it's not something we can just do half-heartedly. And so David says, if I'm really going to give you the gratitude, the thankfulness, the worship, the praise that you deserve, I've got to do it with my whole heart. I can't be half in and half out. I can't give divided loyalty. And so I really want you to ask yourself the question, consider in your heart, what steals your gratitude from God? What is it that gets your loyalty, your worship, your praise, your thanksgiving and robs God of the gratitude that he deserves. Some of us look at our circumstances and we're so focused in our pride on ourselves and our selfishness that that selfishness, that pride, it robs us of our gratitude, that we're not able to give God the praise and the thankfulness that he deserves. So maybe it's your pride. Maybe for you, it's, it, and your pride looks a little bit different Maybe you've convinced yourself that you've earned, that you're entitled to everything that you have. And so your entitlement, your view of yourself, it robs you of your gratitude because you think you're supposed to be thankful to yourself. And you're not willing to admit that God is the giver of every good and perfect gift, that you wouldn't have anything good in your life if God didn't give it to you. A pastor named Jonathan Bakluda says it this way, that it is impossible to be grateful and entitled at the same time. We cannot be grateful for that which we think we are entitled to. So our entitlement, our pride, it robs us of our gratitude. What is robbing you of your thankfulness? What's stealing your gratitude from God? That's the question to ask yourself this morning. Gratitude cannot be half-hearted. It cannot be of a divided loyalty. Romans 8.32 says it this way. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for for us all, how will he not also with him, with Jesus, graciously give us all things? Here's what Paul is saying in this passage of scripture. God did not hold anything back from you. How could you hold back anything from him? God did not hold back even his only son from you. So how could you, how could I hold anything back from him? What are you holding back from God? What's keeping you from giving God the gratitude that he deserves? So how can we be grateful to God? How how do we experience the, how do we look at the world through the lens of gratitude? We've got to do it with our whole hearts, with everything we've got. But secondly, look at verse 2. David says, I bow down toward your holy temple and I give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. 
She, David says that he bows before God in gratitude. What we have to realize, secondly, is that gratitude requires humility. How can I be grateful to God? I've got to do so with humility. And that's why gratitude is often difficult for us, because it requires that we humble ourselves. In order to be thankful for what God has given me, I have to admit that God is the one who's doing the providing and the protecting in my life. I have to be willing to admit that he's the one who is in charge. I have to be willing to admit that I do not deserve it. I have to be willing to admit that I am not the one who's making it happen. The psalmist says, you are above all things. And this is the perspective that's required of us for us to experience gratitude. We have to say to God, all good things come from you. You are above all things. So how can I respond with anything but humility? I cannot be prideful and grateful at the same time. So I've got to be willing to bow myself in humility before God if I'm going to experience gratitude. Seeing God for who he really is humbles us, and that humility causes us to experience gratitude. So why should we thank God? We've got to do so in humility. We do so with our whole hearts, but look at verse 7. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies and your right hand delivers me. Lastly, David says, how do I I experience gratitude? How do I show God thankfulness? I do so no matter what. That gratitude requires true godly gratitude. Not not kind of a wishy-washy, worldly thankfulness. Not that kind of thankfulness. A godly gratitude requires that we are grateful no matter what. Here's what I want you to see this morning. If we are only grateful to God when things are good, we're actually experiencing gratitude in our circumstances and not gratitude in God. If we are only thankful to God, when he has allowed us to experience things or given us things that make us happy, then we're actually grateful for the gift and not for the giver. We're actually grateful for the things God has put in our lives and not actually grateful to God. Gratitude, true, godly, biblical gratitude, we have to experience it no matter what. That kind of gratitude is rooted in God, in his character and who he is, not just in the things that he has given us. Godly gratitude is thankful even when things are hard, even when David says he is walking in the midst of trouble, even when he has enemies on all sides, even then he knows your right hand delivers me. You have raised your hand against my enemy. He knows that thankfulness persists even in our brokenness, because we trust in God and not in our circumstances. So how do we trust God? We, we trust God with our whole hearts. We, we're thankful to God with our whole hearts, with everything that we have. We're thankful to God in humility. We experience gratitude only when we experience humility. And then we are thankful. We are uh, full of gratitude no matter what. But secondly, I want you to see that this passage of Scripture answers the question, why should we thank God? It doesn't just tell us how to thank God, what gratitude looks like practically. It also answers the question back behind that, which is, why should I be thankful anyway? Why should I be grateful to God? Why does God deserve my gratitude? What this text shows us is that we thank God primarily because of who he is, not primarily because of what he's done. First and foremost, it it doesn't mean that we don't thank God for the things he's given us. Of course, we should thank God for what he's done. You have been blessed by God. I've been blessed by God, and we should thank God for that. But this passage shows us we primarily thank God for who he is, not primarily for what he's done. The root of our thankfulness is not the good things God has done for us, It is the good God that he is to us. Our gratitude is rooted in God's character, in his nature, in his person. And so the way that we know that, the the reason that we know that is in this passage of scripture, all of the answers to why should we thank God are about God's character. They're about who God is, not simply because of what he's done. So who does this passage say God is? Why should that lead us to gratitude? 
first this text shows us that God is glorious, that God is exalted, that he's good. Look at verse 2. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. David says who you are, your nature, and the things that you've promised me, your covenant, those things, you've exalted them above everything else. His name represents who he is. David says, your character, your nature, it is perfect. It is glorious. It is holy. It is good. And God has proven to you that he is good. David says his words, when he says your words you've exalted above all things, he's, he's talking about his deeds, the proof of his nature, what he says and what he does. God is good in his nature, not just his actions. You and I don't just have to trust in what God has done in the past and hope that God will be good to us in the future. That, that's a faith, it's a gratitude that's based only on what God has done. Instead, I know that God isn't just someone who does good things, but God is good, he's glorious, he's exalted above all things in his nature. And so I don't have to just hope on hope that God will be good in the future. I can know with confidence, standing in faith, that God will be good in the future, not just because it's what he's done in the past, but because it's who he is. I can experience gratitude rooted not just in what God has done, but in his character, in his nature. God deserves your gratitude because he is good. And you can know that God is, that the things that God is doing in your life are good because you can trust that he is good. John Piper says it this way, God is always doing 10,000 things in your life and you might be aware of three of them. God is doing more in your life than you could ever comprehend, than I could ever understand. God is up to so much more than you and I can see. And we can trust him, not because we will believe off the top of our head that all of those things are good, but because we can trust that God is good right down to his very nature. Why should we experience gratitude? Because we believe God is exalted above all things, that he is good, he is glorious, he is righteous, no matter what our circumstances say. So we thank God because he's glorious. Secondly, this text shows us we thank God because he cares for us, because he's compassionate. Look at verse six. For though the Lord is high, this is beautiful, this beautiful contrast in this text. God's exalted above all things, but David doesn't want you to forget. Yeah, it's true that God is exalted above all things. Even though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly. Even though God is above all things, he transcends what we can comprehend. Even though God is above us in such a way that we could never hope to get to him. Even though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly. He cares for the brokenhearted. He is close to the sinner. Remember, this is what Jesus is speaking about in Luke chapter five when he says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus says he is coming to seek out those who know they need him. Jesus is a doctor. He's a physician who is seeking out the sick, the spiritually broken, the needy, the poor in spirit, as he would say in his Sermon on the Mount. The doctor goes and seeks after the sick. Imagine a doctor who's unwilling to see sick patients. What kind of doctor would that be? You walk into the doctor's office, you have strep throat. I had strep throat as a kid like a hundred times. They were, I actually think they said I was a carrier of strep throat. I don't know what that means, but it's not fun. Okay, it wasn't enjoyable. Imagine you have strep throat, you go to the doctor, they're like, so sorry. We actually only see well people at this doctor's office. We don't take any sick people. So sorry, you'll have to go somewhere else. You'd be like, shut your doors. What are you doing? What kind of doctor's office, what kind of hospital refuses to see sick people? That's why it exists. Jesus says, you want to know who I am? You want to know my character? I'm a physician. I'm a doctor. I'm here for sick people. And what, the, what Satan has done, what sin has done, is it so clouded our vision that we think God is turning away sick people at the door. 
We think Jesus won't see us, doesn't care for us, is repulsed by us because we're sick with sin, because we're broken, because we don't have it all together. And so in that brokenness, in that, in that darkness that Satan's clouded our eyes with, we think we've got to act like we've got it all together when we come in those doors. Jesus says, no, I've come for people who are sick. I've come for the broken people. You experience healing when you admit you're needy. When you admit you're sick, when you come to God with your brokenness and say, I can't do anything about this, I need you to. Jesus is a physician whose heart is near to the broken heart, the psalmist would say, who in our passage here says, regards the lowly, looks for, seeks out, responds in compassion to those who know they're poor in spirit, who are lowly, who are broken, who are sick. Maybe this morning you thought you were too far gone. You haven't experienced gratitude in your relationship with Jesus. Maybe you don't even have one and you're not experiencing any gratitude in your life because you thought that you were too far gone for God. You thought that he was turning away from you. You thought he was angry with you. You thought he was kicking you to the curb, leaving you outside of the door. What this this passage shows us It's that God's not just good up there in the clouds. He's not just good out there in the world somewhere, but God is good to you. God doesn't just love the world. God loves you. God doesn't just want people to experience his grace. God is extending his grace to you. There's no one too far gone. There's no one too sick. He's a doctor seeking out sick patients, and it's good news for you if you're one of them. So we can experience gratitude because God is compassionate, because he cares for us, because he regards the lowly, and you and I are the lowly. So we thank God because he's glorious, because he cares for us. But lastly, I want you to see we thank God because he's faithful. Verse 8, the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. I love the confidence, the faith in this statement. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. God is faithful. That's what the psalmist is saying. Your steadfast love, uh, another way to translate, translate with this would be your covenant love, your promises, oh God, endure forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. God will fulfill his purpose for you. God will come through on his promises. When we say that God is faithful, here's what we mean. God will always do what he said he's going to do. God isn't the friend who sometimes shows up 15 minutes late. I know we've all got friends like that. You're like, you said you would be here at 10, but it's 10, 17. Like, that's not just late. It's it's actually embarrassing now. Like, I'm actually upset at 17 minutes. We all have friends who are faithful some of the time. Sometimes they do what they said they're going to do. Sometimes they show up for us when we thought they should. Sometimes they actually come through. Sometimes they come through on their promises, but not all the time. God isn't faithful like that. He's not kind of faithful. He's not sometimes faithful. God will fulfill his purpose for you. God will do the things that he said he's going to do. This is what's amazing about this passage of scripture. And and this is all over the Bible. This is almost always how God describes his faithfulness. God isn't faithful just to some person out there. He's not faithful to just some idea of who he's supposed to be. God is faithful to his promises, to his word. God's faithful to do what he said he's going to do. And so I love the way the pastor at Grace Church in Greenville, he he said it this way, I'll never forget, I love this. God is faithful to himself, to his word. And so if you want to experience God's faithfulness, you better align yourself with God's word. If you want to experience God's faithfulness, you better line up with him. God's going to be faithful to his word, to his promises, no matter what. So align your life with what he says. We can be grateful, we can experience gratitude because we know God will always come through on his promises. And God has made promises to you. He's promised that he would never leave you or forsake you. He's promised that if you would call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. He's promised if you'll submit to him that you can experience his peace that passes all understanding. He's promised that if you will repent of your sin, place your faith in him, that you can experience grace, eternal life with him. He's promised that his work on the cross was enough to pay the price for your sins. 
He promised that his resurrection means that you can have new life. And he has promised us that he will come again one day to make all things new, to take us home with him, to experience eternity with him. God has made promises to you and you can take him to the bank. You can know that God will always do what he says he could do. And if that doesn't cause us to experience gratitude, if the gospel daily reminding ourselves, if, if that truth, if those promises don't cause us to experience gratitude and thankfulness, I don't know what will. I'll just be honest with you. If that doesn't make you feel grateful, I'd really have you consider if you've actually experienced the gospel for yourself. We can experience gratitude in our lives. Why? Why even when things are hard? Why even when I've lost so much? Why even when things aren't going my way? Why even when I feel broken? Why even when I feel far from God? Why should I still experience gratitude? Because even when all of those things are falling apart around us, the gospel, God's covenant to you, his promises, those things are still true. Why should you experience gratitude? Because God is not leaving you in your brokenness. He's not turning on you in your sin. He's not forgotten you in your pain. He's coming back for you. And you can experience abundant life and eternal life in him and him alone. God is going to do what he said he's going to do. So before we jump into this Christmas season We've seen that God is calling us not just to be thankful on a day, but to experience a life of gratitude. That we can be grateful, we can see the world through a lens of gratitude because of who God is, because he's good, because he's glorious, because he's compassionate, because he's faithful. And we've seen that we can show God our gratitude by giving him our whole heart, by humbling ourselves and by showing him thanks no matter what and in every season. So this morning, even as we pray, even as we respond to him in worship, let's give God our gratitude. Let's respond to him with the thankfulness that he deserves. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the cross, that there's an empty tomb and a soon returning savior that tells us that all of your promises are yes and amen in Jesus. Thank you, God, that you are faithful. So God, we want to give back all that we can give. We want to return to you the only thing we've got, and that's our gratitude. It's our worship. It's our whole hearts. Holy Spirit, meet us where we're at. Fill our hearts with gratitude so we can respond to you in the way that you've called us to. Lord, as we celebrate baptism next week, as we celebrate the Christmas season, as we pray this place will be filled with people who don't know you, God, commission us out as missionaries to a lost and dying world who will share this gratitude, this compassion, this love, this grace that you've given us with a dying and broken world around us. We love you, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen.